Just as a representative of the OFM DFM committee, I want to formally welcome all of you here this afternoon and uh, thank the uh, opportunity here for this uh, latest CARE seminar. And I've no doubt that it will be very interesting and very informative to those of you who have managed to be here this afternoon. I have to apologise in advance because I have to go because our OFM committee starts at 2 p.m. and we have the First and Deputy First Minister at the committee this afternoon, so I need to be there in attendance, otherwise I'll get my knuckles wrapped and uh, Mark Down is not attending. But uh, this particular seminar today focuses on the important area of participatory governance, in particular citizen involvement and female representation. A perceived disconnect um, between citizens and decision makers is a consistent theme running through politics. And here in the Assembly, the consociational power sharing model that underpins these institutions has both its supporters and its critics, as you know. But one of the key questions posed by our first presentation is whether greater citizen involvement in the decision making process uh, could lead to progress on certain contentious issues. Last month, the Committee for Culture, Arts and Leisure published its report, Inclusion in the Arts of Working Class Communities. Now, the purpose of that inquiry was to examine the possibility of the accessibility and outreach activity of arts venues and bodies and how these impact on inclusion in the arts of working class communities. As part of its evidence gathering, the committee heard from local authorities on how they promoted the arts at a local level. The Voluntary Arts Ireland, represented here today, fed into the committee's report. Their submission noted that fragmented connections between grassroots groups, local authorities and the professional arts sectors often lead to poor promotion of events, activities and less participation by citizens. The committee noted that greater partnership across all levels of government and the arts sectors was required if inclusion in the arts was to be enhanced. We look forward to hearing more, of course, on these issues and in particular the Creative Citizens Initiative. And finally, as we are less than three months away from an Assembly election, it is, of course, timely then to look at the issue of candidate selection and how the selection procedures used by political parties might impact on the ability of women to seek election. <clears throat> of course, a, a recent election in the south of Ireland returned 35 female TDs, and this was the first election there which had gender quotas in which they were used. And I would say, from my own party point of view, the nine new members of the the doll that we brought forward, five of them are women, but there's still an awful, awful lot more work needs to be done across all of the parties and within the political institutions to ensure that more women are uh, brought forward through election as they should be. The, um, furthermore, the issue of female representation was examined by the Assembly and the Executive Review Committee last year, and I know that some of the issues raised in that report will be explored further here today. To gain a better understanding of these issues, we have three presentations. Our first is by Dr. John Gary from the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's University, Belfast. And Dr. Gary will look at the issue of deliberative democracy in Northern Ireland, enhancing the quality of governance by involving citizens in decision making. Secondly, we have Dr. Uh, Victoria Durer with Kevin Murphy the Foundry Arts Ireland, and Rosaline Lowry, Arts and Events Development Officer at Mid and East Antrim Council. They will be discussing the Creative Citizens Programme, Local Government Involving Citizens in Arts Development. Finally, Dr Neil Matthews from the School of Politics, International Studies and Philosophy at Queen's will be examining the issue of candidate selection in Northern Ireland, a cold house for women, question mark. You're all very welcome, to, of course, to today's seminar, and we are very much delighted to have you. And I think you will agree that we have a very and very interesting afternoon ahead. Um, just before we hand over to Dr. Gary, I would just make a couple of points, and that is that this uh, uh, seminar is, is actually quite timely, given the week's in it and the topic that we're discussing today. We are in the middle of International Women's Week. There's a lot of activity around the Assembly and elsewhere to mark that very important occasion. The Assembly Women's Caucus, which is the first in the institutions in these islands, was established last evening, and uh, that had all party agreement and all party representation, which is very good development. And that was launched in the, in the last night uh, by the Speaker. And thirdly, then, in the recent negotiations, we had the uh, establishment agreed 
of the Civic Advisory Panel. And that panel is being formed as we speak, and I, and I certainly do hope and look forward to the, that panel playing its very important and contributive role in making sure we have a much wider range of people across all of our communities, including women, of course, in the, uh, in, in the issues that we're talking about here today, where it's governance, civic participation, and civic leadership. So on that note, I then formally then hand over to Dr. Gary and wishes all the very best for the remainder of the seminar this afternoon. Thank you. Do we really need politicians? We complain about them a lot, but could we have democracy without them? How about people like you and me, the citizens, make the decisions? How about a citizens' assembly? After all, democracy was not always like it is now. In ancient Greece, randomly selected citizens made important decisions, chosen by a machine in a type of lottery. And it's not just the ancient Greeks. Juries are modern-day examples of randomly selected citizens making decisions concerning all of us. Many countries also hold referendums, where all citizens can vote on a political decision. An advantage of randomly selecting citizens, of course, is those chosen to make the decisions would be ordinary citizens, not necessarily the rich or the well-connected, but all types of men and women, rich and poor, old and young. So let's imagine how this may work, say, in a place like Northern Ireland. If we randomly chose 500 ordinary people and asked them to make a key political decision, do you think good deliberation and sensible decisions would follow? A recent study showed that we can perhaps trust ourselves to make political decisions, including controversial ones. The idea of the Citizens' Assembly was put to the test over the hairy issue of flags. A thousand citizens were asked if the Union flag should fly on government buildings. A. All the time. B. Not at all. Or C. On designated days. Overall results showed that a majority, 54%, agreed with the compromise position, with 29% against. But there were differences depending on which sample group you were in. In the study conducted by Queen's University, the randomly selected citizens were prepared in different ways. Some were given no preparation, others were given an outline of the issues and a summary of the arguments, while another group were asked to imagine a dialogue about how they would discuss the different options with someone from the other community. Look, this flag's very important to my identity. Really? Yeah, and it's been flying 365 days a year up to now and I want to keep it that way. Well, look, you say that, but many people I know think it's an oppressive symbol, me included, and don't want to see it at all. Not at all. An oppressive symbol. But we do live in the UK, and it's the flag of the UK, so we should be allowed to fly it. But look, in other parts of the UK, it only flies on designated days. Designated days? I'm not 100% keen on this. Prompted as to how they would amicably end it, many added... How about a pint? Let's agree to disagree. Of this dialogue group, 59% were in favour of the compromise proposal, which was 11% more than those that had no preparation. A conclusion was a majority tended to gravitate towards a centre ground position, and more so with preparation and dialogue in advance. So could this perhaps work after all? Maybe we, in Northern Ireland, could do without politicians for many decisions. But would the politicians let it work? Surely turkeys wouldn't vote for Christmas? Of MLAs asked, only 17% thought it was a good idea. And what about ordinary citizens? We accept randomly selected juries. We accept the principle of referendums. Perhaps political decisions which politicians often find difficult, could be made with the authority of a cross-section of ordinary people. Perhaps we wouldn't need retired US politicians intervening to sort out problems between parties. 62% of ordinary citizens were in favour of this proposal. Obviously, there are many difficult decisions to be made in Northern Ireland, just like in other societies. And perhaps citizens would not be best suited to deliberate on all of them. But maybe we, the people, could decide on some of them. What do you think?
Well, thanks very much for watching the world premiere release of my five-minute animation. What's great about making an animation, giving a talk like this, I pretty much said everything in there, and I could just stand over there watching it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kieran Gallagher, who's the animator and in the audience here today, for fantastic work on the animation in this uh, five-minute animated film. And also like to thank Patrick Leonard, who can't be here today, for fantastic production. Um, I want to flesh out some of the things that were offered in that five-minute presentation. And the first thing to say is the Citizens, a, sorry, the, the citizens Assembly, which was being discussed in that animation, typically in, in terms of international terminology, is a type of deliberative democracy. And the word deliberative democracy is becoming incre increasingly widely used internationally as a way of giving citizens an extra voice in um, politics in general. And the word deliberation is just a fancy word for thinking about stuff. So deliberative democracy is bringing citizens in to decision making and bringing them in in such a way as to facilitate and encourage considered and reflective views from them. And there's a fair bit of international deliberative democracy exercises ongoing across the world, citizens' assemblies in Australia, in Canada, in Belgium, and in the Euro European Union as well. And the question here today is, could deliberative democracy in the form of a citizens' assembly help matters in Northern Ireland? Could it play a valuable or constructive role? And obviously, we're in a particular context in Northern Ireland, in a consociational, post-conflict, power-sharing, institutional setup. So if one is talking about having a citizens' assembly here, inevitably, the debate is in, couched in terms of, should we have institutional reform of some kind or another? And in that debate, we have proponents of the power-sharing structures and opponents of the power-sharing structure. Proponents find power-sharing pretty good because in a post-conflict setting, it uh, provides a representation in parliament and in the executive of politicians from different communities in Northern Ireland. And it allows all people from all communities a, a voice and gives them veto powers over legislation that they don't like. Um, opponents of power sharing think that it's not terribly democratic because there isn't a clear opposition as well as a government. And power sharing is very much um, elite driven bargaining process. Um, some would say for good reason, and therefore doesn't allow in the citizen's voice quite as much as some people would like. And one of the problems with power sharing, critics say, is that it almost inevitably leads to a lot of gridlock in the system. Parties can't agree with each other on certain issues, flags, welfare, reform, parading, and so on. And whether you're in favour of power sharing or against, you would probably think that it's not a bad idea to seriously consider institutional reform, which would help oil the wheels of decision-making in Northern Ireland and lessen the probability of severe gridlock. And a citizens' assembly is one possible institutional reform to help. So, to what extent could a citizens' assembly, as described in the film clip, help resolve long-running contentious issues? And in the clip, our project focused, for example, on the flag display as an illustrative example of a difficult issue. And we wanted to put into effect a classic experimental design in order to identify what happens to citizens when you randomly select citizens and you bring them in and you facilitate them to seriously consider an issue, i.e. you get them to deliberate. What happens to their views? Do they become more hardline, more compromising, or does it not have any effect at all? And in order to find out if something has an effect, the best way to do it is to do it in an experimental design. So analogous to clinical trials, if you want to know if an, a drug works, you have a control group who doesn't get the drug, and you have a group of people who get the drug, and you measure outcomes. So in this experiment, we basically injected, to, I, won't, I won't continue the drug analogy too far, it'll, it'll get messy. We inject deliberation into some people, we do not inject deliberation to others, and we measure their views on the flag issue and see if there's any differences. 
a question arises is how best to facilitate deliberation, how best to facilitate citizens to seriously reflect on and think about in an, an informed manner a contentious issue such as flag display. And in our project, we utilize three methods of facilitating reflection. Um, some citizens in our, in our uh, experiment watched a mm -hmm. short video which gave them some background information on the flag dispute. Some citizens also got a second video which didn't give them fa factual background information. It gave them a summary of the different arguments at play in the flag display issue. And some citizens also got a, a request to imagine that they were having a conversation with someone who had different views from them. So it was a, a, a kind of mental simulation task. They were asked to imagine that they were talking to someone with whom they disagreed on this issue, and to have a to and fro in their mind on what would happen in that debate. We had five groups in, in total, but the easiest way to describe the differences is to talk about percentages. But in the paper, uh, I go into more detail on mean differences, on scales and stuff. But th there's in the control group, the people who didn't get the drug, they weren't asked to deliberate in any way, shape, or form. They, 48% of them, when asked, agreed with the idea of having designated days as the policy option for flag flying, which we construe as being the compromise option in between flags all the time, flags never. The people in the full deliberation group who were given background factual information, they were given a description of the the arguments pro and con each policy proposal, and they engaged in the mental simulation task of an imagined conversation with another with whom they would disagree. In other words, full, just throw as much deliberation at these people as conceivably possible in a short time span. Such people in that group, 59% of them, said that they were in favor of uh, the, the compromise option. In other words, it's an 11 statistically significant 11 percentage point differential. What one can infer from this, even though this is just one study and it's just one way of doing things on one issue, but what one can infer from this is that if you go down the route of having a citizens assembly in which you have a, you randomly select citizens to be in this assembly and you instruct them to deliberate in some depth about an issue such as flags, what happens to them in that process, we suggest on foot of this evidence, is that they become a bit more compromising. They become a bit more open to the middle ground issue. Not hugely, not making any mad claims here, but to a statistically significant and non-trivial percentage differential extent. A question then arises um, if one is thinking about suggesting a citizens' assembly analogous to what was seen in the video clip and what I've just described. This could be just pie in the sky, idealistic, utopian nonsense. There are two groups of people who have to buy into this to some extent in order for it to get legs, gain traction. The general public have to be able to see this idea as even vaguely sensible. Otherwise, they'll just think this is nonsense and quite rightly will have nothing to do with it. The political elite, the MLAs, have to buy into this to some extent, otherwise it won't, it, won't, it won't get anywhere because the political elite are the ones who make the running in terms of debating institutional reform. In order to get a handle on the extent to which the general public and the MLAs either support or oppose the idea of a citizens' assembly to deal with contentious issues in Northern Ireland, we conducted two additional completely separate studies. One is a survey of the general public, saying to them, what do you think of this idea? And the exact same questions were asked of MLAs, what do you think of this idea? And in one of the questions, the wording was as follows. On some important issues, such as flag display and the issue of welfare reform, the political parties in Northern Ireland find it very hard to agree with each other, and this leads to political crises. When such a crisis happens, there may be a number of ways to try and resolve it. 
please tell me to what extent you think each of the following approaches is a good idea or a bad idea. We then present respondents, the general public and MLAs, with the full list of all the ways we go about trying to figure things out here. Um, so we say, what do you think of the idea of, let's just get the British government to sort it out. The general public, about two-fifths, say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. MLAs don't really like that, 7%. Or we say, get the British and Irish governments to sort it out. Slightly more of the general public, 54, and a quarter of MLAs. How about get the British government and the Northern Irish parties to sort it out? That gets a lot of people. Two-thirds of the general public and 61% of MLAs. Uh, yeah. Uh, get the British and Irish governments and the Northern Ireland parties. Get, sorry, get the British government and Irish governments and the Northern Ireland parties. That gets about two thirds of each sample. Then this is the kind of grey-haired American sorted out solution, which is get someone from outside Britain and Ireland, such as a politician or diplomat from the United States, to chair talks between the Northern Ireland parties and come up with a solution. That doesn't get much support from either group. 28% of the general public, almost two fifths of MLAs. There's a big differential on the next one, which is just hold a referendum on the issue, and that way, that way we'll sort it out. 61% of the general public, but only a quarter of MLAs. How about let's just have an election? That's democracy, right? Let's sort it out that way. A quarter of the general public, and only 7% of MLAs. The biggest differential between the public and the politicians on all of the possible ways of trying to resolve contentious issues is with respect to the final one, the citizens' assembly option, which is get a cross-section of ordinary citizens on a citizens' assembly to learn about the issue, listen to a presentation of all the main arguments, and then reach a decision. You get quite a lot of the general public, 65%, but you only get 17% of MLAs. That's the, the point of this long list, is to try to appropriately situate the possible option of citizens' assemblies as a, uh, as a contentious issue resolution device in the context of all of the array of options. And what we find is there's a very big differential between politicians and the elite, sorry, politicians and the general public. However, when you ask a slightly different question, which is as follows, you get much more similarity between the general public and MLAs. If a citizens' assembly of this kind was introduced, do you think it should make the final decision on an issue? Not a single MLA said that was a good idea, and about a quarter of the public. But if you say, do you think it should make a recommendation to be considered by politicians? 61% of each sample say, uh, say yes. What's interesting there is the MLAs in the first slide they weren't interested in it. it you know, only 17% had any time for this idea. But if you, if you phrase, if you pitch the idea yeah. as a citizen's assembly, it doesn't make the final decision, but it gives some advice. It contributes to the making of a decision. You get much more traction with the MLAs. If you ask people to evaluate the, the, their, how, what they perceive as the competence level of ordinary people to make decisions in a citizen's assembly, the question is, in general, how good or bad do you think ordinary people would be at making decisions if they were selected to serve on a citizen's assembly? And only 17% of the public and 17% of MLAs said that they would be pretty rubbish, which isn't bad. Less than a fifth said they'd be hopeless. And most in each sample said that they would be good, 56% of the public and almost half of MLAs. So, so far the MLAs don't like the idea in terms of it making a final decision, quite happy with it in terms of making a recommendation, and are quite positive about the competence of ordinary citizens to engage and to do so. If we then th ask a question about what the public suspect would be motivating citizens who are acting in a citizens' assembly to see if they would be 
selfishly, malignly motivated if they actually got into this thing and were just looking after themselves. The question wording is, in a citizens' assembly, do you think ordinary people would try to come to a decision that's good for everyone in Northern Ireland, or would they just try to look after the interests of their own community, or just look after their own personal interest? Somewhat comfortingly, less than a fifth of each sample, less than a fifth of the public and less than a fifth of MLAs, say that they would be just looking after themselves. And it's about evenly split between those who would say they would look out for the good of Northern Ireland as a whole, or they would look out for the good of their community. A final, I think, question tries to elicit the views of the general public and MLAs um, of a citizens' assembly, but does so directly in the context of saying, look, here's three ways we can make decisions democratically. We can do the elections thing. We can do the referendums thing. Or we could do the citizens' assembly thing. Tell me whether you are in favour or oppose each one. What's interesting here is there's very little variation amongst the general public with respect to these three democratic decision-making mechanisms. They're all between 51 and 57%, so more or less supportive of all of them. There is massive variation amongst MLAs in terms of whether they support, whether they like one or other of these things. 98% of MLAs are in favour of elections. So the, it's not 100%. There is someone around here who doesn't like elections. Um, three quarters go for referendums and only 17% for citizens' assemblies when the question is phrased in that way. So... Um, to kind of sum up, I think I've got about three minutes left or so. Is that right? You remember. Um, what, my, my, my job here today is to try to convince everyone that this is a fantastic idea and a panacea for all our ills, nor that it's a rubbish idea and will make everything worse. I think what I'm trying to do is put it seriously on the table as a possible option when we are discussing institutional reform. And there are some possible advantages when we address the question like that. Whatever else a citizens' assembly might be, it would be a very representative body. The citizens would be randomly chosen. That means statistically, mathematically, logically and inevitably they will be a perfect microcosm of society as a whole. They will be a mirror image of society as a whole within a couple of percentage points. So one of the discussions later will be about how do we address the problem of not enough women in politics. Well, randomly select the politicians. You will have exactly 50% women in politics. Some people are concerned about not enough young people are interested in politics. If you have a randomly selected citizens' assembly, you will have as many young people in politics as there are young people, percentage-wise. So if 30% you know, of the population are less than the age of 35, 30% of the people in the Citizens' Assembly will be less than 35. No matter how you break down society, by logical virtue of the fact that you're randomly selecting the Citizens' Assembly, it will be a mirror image of society as a whole. That is quite a powerful thing, both symbolically and in terms of rep genuinely representing people. Because you can put that, to compare that to essentially... And I don't mean this critically. This is just the fact, right? Parliaments are full of men, middle-aged men, relatively well-educated middle-aged men. It's just, that's a fact, right? And some people find that, in terms of democratic representation, problematic from all kinds of perspectives. So Citizens' Assembly overcomes effortlessly the representation deficit as it's typically perceived in current politics. Uh, in terms of w the types of decisions that might be made in a citizens' assembly, our experiments suggest that what is likely to happen under conditions of deliberation is that the citizens' assembly would move towards being more conciliatory, not more hardline. And if you think moving people in a bit more conciliatory or compromise oriented manner is, is good, if you think that's good, 
then this is one thing to think about, because the evidence suggests that that is the direction that they would move and not the other direction. In terms of summarising the feasibility of this with respect to would it have citizen support, would it have MLA support, um, perhaps surprisingly, I was surprised, I had no idea, there's, there's very little research in, done before into this kind of thing, so I had no idea how the public would react. And on the survey asking the general public, they were remarkably supportive of the idea of a citizens' assembly. The MLAs are not supportive if the citizens' assembly makes a decision. The MLAs are significantly supportive if the citizens' assembly is an advisory body and makes recommendations that can contribute to a decision making. I end it there. I've lost track of time a little bit, but I reckon I should probably stop. I have nothing more to say, so that's a good time to, to stop as well. So.